Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to our Monday, December 21st, 2020, a regularly scheduled uh, Board of Education meeting. Merry Christmas and thank you for joining us. Uh, will you please join me in reciting Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, of the United States, States, States of America, to the flag of the Republic, to the Republic of stands, one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. All right, thank you, everybody. And before we do our roll call, I just want to remind any viewers that may be watching or joining us that uh, the board is not um, going to engage in active uh, dialogue or conversation tonight. Um, we are here to listen to you and to uh, hear what you're saying, and if necessary, we will get you a response as soon as we possibly can. So thank you for your patience, and uh, we appreciate you tuning in tonight. Uh, Mr. Roush, please start us off with roll call. Yep. President McFarland. Here. Vice President Singer. Here. Secretary Roush is here. Treasurer Friedel. Can you hear us, Mary? Mary's right there. I see her. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. I'm Mary. Uh, Member Baker? Here. Member Blazy? Here. Member right. Lauterbach? Here. All right. We, all, we have all seven. Fantastic. Nice to see everybody. Okay. Uh, let's move on to item 2.1. This is our consent agenda. These are the approval of the minutes from November 16, 2020 of the regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, next is item 2.2, uh, a list of staff members that have announced their resignation. Uh, next to the consent agenda is item 2.3. This is the approval of the school's bills for the month of October 2020 as listed in the check registered registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the total amount of $9,092,312. Item 2.4 is approval of uh, legal bills from Thrun Law Firm for $6,045, dated October 29, 2020, and those are for professional legal fees. Take a motion to approve the consent agenda items as listed. So, so moved. Support. support. Motion by John, support by uh, Pam. Any discussion on any of these items, 2.1 through 2.4? Mary. Okay. That was Mary. That was me. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the support was Mary. I, I apologize, Pam. Thank you, Mary. Brad, it sounded like you were going to say something. Yes. Um, for the summary statement for Troon, uh, it mentions a couple times in there that um, there's a balance forward from the October 29 statement. And looking back in both of our November meetings, we did not approve those amounts of the $2,322 and the $1,479 from the October 29 Troon statement that didn't make this packet. I'm sorry I didn't alert you to that prior to this, but I just realized it a couple minutes ago. So the, the balance forward items we have not reviewed. The current charges of the 2,244 that's enclosed in the packet, we could okay. approve. I, I'm sorry, Mike, did you say something? No, I'm. Oh. Uh, any, can you elaborate on that a little bit, Mike? Or? Later that month. Yeah, I'm. I, I don't want to talk out of space. I don't have it here, but my my. This is not uncommon that Truans bills trails, Brad, and so I think the amount you're approving tonight is the approval for that month. So it's not uncommon for the statement to have uh, trailing on there. But uh, Brian, are you looking it up? I don't have. I, I'm trying to, but I, I guess I don't understand the question. Yeah, I've got, so I've got the November Board of Education minutes up right now, and we approved September of 2020 in November, so this would be consistent with the timing. Right. right. So, right, so, we don't, so we the don't amount have... tonight is what you're approving, Brad? What's that? So it's the dollar amount that you're approving tonight. 
Right, but we haven't seen the breakdown of the bill for $2,322 or the $1,479. We never saw the breakdown of what that was for. It's a balance forward on the statement from the October 29 statement that was balanced, that's moved forward. But the detail of it is not in this packet, nor was it in our November packet. Just like Phil said, September, we approved. But we have not approved October's detail. We certainly can provide you the detail if it's not in there. The amount, what we're asking to approve is the dollar amounts. Okay, well, I don't think that we're going to approve very good. detail, but. We can go back and see. We can go back and research and see what occurred afterwards. Obviously. Okay, so we'll get that. We'll get that breakdown then um, to the board members uh, if it was somehow overlooked in our informational packets that we get. Um, thank you, Brad, for pointing that out. Uh, I, I think we should still go ahead and pay the bills, and we will get the uh, breakdown of the invoice. Uh, Shortly. Okay. I have a couple other items to talk about, Scott, that sure. are part of our uh, last month's minutes. For the Barton Mallow presentation, um, at the end of the presentation, um, Daryl Dombrow made some statements about some things relative to our bond that are not accurate. And I wanted to get those corrected. Only one of them is mentioned in the minutes, but there were two other items that he listed. One, he said that there was $12 million spent at each high school, which we as a board know that that is not true. It roughly started at about a 12 to $13 million budget for both schools at the start of the bond, but $3.882 million was removed from Midland High, and 800000 was added to the Dow High budget. So it was not $12 million per high school, as he stated in his summary at last month's meeting. I'm sure everybody agrees with that. No, I'm not sure I do. Without having it in front of you, um, I think that's that's accurate up to a point. So you've had several change orders that have occurred at Midland High School that's added money back in. So for example, last month, you approved a little over a million dollars for the bleachers. So I think just saying that openly um, in a meeting right now, I, I don't think is accurate. We, I think we'll have to go back and run another summary and show, show where those dollars have been moved around. So the three that was moved back in 15 or whatever it occurred, um, there's been several funds added back into, into the middle and high. Both buildings have seen increases in spending as we've had used savings and we've used interest and we've had savings on contingencies. So that net when we're done, the buildings will be at 12 million, could be more than even 12 million. Well, not according to phase uh, series one, two, and three in the Bart Hall summary that's in our packet. Correct. But we're not done. So we keep adding and making changes. It's fluid. You, you approved 1.1 million last month. Okay. So, but what he stated was the beginning of what the intent was. We, uh, to date, we are not on target to spend 12 million at each school. It's three point eight million dollar difference between the two. I don't think so. I, I, I think you're taking the original summation, and we'd have to go back and tra track all those pieces of it. Well, I have series one, two, and three, and the pluses and negatives to all series. And do you have the one point one million from the last? month for example we'd have to go back it's fluid it changes on a regular moment so so community stadium which is 50 percent for each school so that'd be a net some you know 
Brad, it's about what campus. The dollars are simply tied to a building in the campus broke out that way. So asking us to change the minutes based on Mr. Uh, Dombrow's statement, it, it's what his statement was, if it's accurate or not. We, we can, def we, we can, and you're asking me to defend that right now on the spot. I'd have to go back and we have to run all those dollar figures. Okay, well, that's what the report shows, and I am pointing it out that according to his own documents, that's simply not true. So, are you asking to change the minutes because that was his statement? If the minutes reflect what his statement was, I'm saying that what he stated was wrong. Very good. Okay. Anything else, Brad? Yep. Along that same line, um, Mr. Dombrow also stated that 90% of all of the work has been done by local contractors. And we've been round and round with that about 20 different times. And Originally, it started out as the Great Lakes Bay region, then it turned to <coughs> Central Michigan, and then it turned to a bubble map that is on the web page. And on that bubble map are spots on that map that go from West Branch to south of Flint to Big Raft to Bad Axe. And on that map, those items are shaded light green and they are called local. And in that local column is 77 miles, 58 miles, 63 miles. And I think it is a shame to call 77 miles local. I don't know about you, but I don't do too much grocery shopping in Big Rapids or go to, Big, or to, go to West Branch to fill up for gas or to go south to Flint to get a bunch to eat. So, I think that saying that 90% of our contracted work in our bond was done by local forces, I think is totally inaccurate. If it was done by members of the Great Lakes Bay region, then I would agree that it's accurate as 90%. But the table that are on our webpage today show contractors that are 77 miles away, 50 miles away, 63 miles away, and they're called local. So I'm not a fan of saying that our bond has been done by 90% of local forces because that 90% is inaccurate. Do those four that you referenced fall within the 10% that are not local? What's that? Are the four that you referenced, the, the Big Rapids, the Flint, uh, do, are those, do those four fall within the 10% that are not local? There's 90% no, that were no, local, 10% that were not. Some do and some don't. Uh oh. Okay. So, if you wanted to look at it, we have this. So, Oakland County, Southfield, Michigan, 122 miles, that's a non local. Marlette, Michigan, 77 miles away, is included as local. 53 miles away in Genesee County is listed as local. 64 miles away in south of Flint is listed as local. We've had teachers that travel that far to and from work on a daily basis. I, I, I think you're pulling straws out of a hat. That is just crazy. Hey, Scott, I, I guess, I, I guess I, I've got a couple of comments I want to make. One is... Sure, John. My understanding of the minutes is the minutes reflect what was said at a board meeting. I could walk into a board meeting and say that the sky is purple. Now that might be an untrue statement. But the minutes would reflect, Lauterbach said the sky is purple. Now, if somebody wants to say, John, you're wrong, that's, that's one discussion. But to come back a month later and say, I'm not going to, you know, let's debate whether the minutes are accurate because we disagree with what somebody said in the meeting, I don't think is the purpose of adopting the minutes. The minutes, the purpose of the minutes is to say, 
this is what happened at the meeting so that members of the public can read the minutes and be apprised of what we talked about at our meeting. If any of us thinks that what a speaker at a meeting says is incorrect or we have a policy difference with it, that's totally fine. We should absolutely talk about that. I'm not sure that the discussion of whether we should vote thumbs up or thumbs down on the minutes is necessarily the time to take issue with what's in the minutes. And then if I am understand a governance issue, I'd like to know that. Okay. I don't have a problem with what's in the minutes, John, but I just want to point out that what the minutes states is erroneous and not true at all. Okay. So but I, I, what's but Okay, but it's hang fine. on, let me finish, Brad. I, I, listened, I listened to all of your stuff. Mm -hmm. This is not the time to debate whether what Dombro said was true or false. And he may have been completely wrong. But the point right now is, do the minutes accurately reflect what was said at the meeting? If they do, they do. If, if, you, if you want to take up the issue of how to define local contractor, that's a absolutely fair conversation to have but the issue the issue is are we going to adopt the minutes or not so we either are or we aren't otherwise we can go all night with policy differences about whether 77 miles is local or 30 miles is local thanks so, john that's all i got okay good points thank you very much okay any further discussion with respect to the minutes, the consent agenda? Okay, all in favor of adopting, uh, of, of approval of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next up, item three. Uh, these are our presentations to the board. Uh, 3.1 is Shining Stars, Mr. Sherrill. I have two um, outstanding shine stars to bring to you tonight. They're both on the Zoom link if you would like to congratulate them later. Um, the first is Melissa Toner. Melissa has been part of the MPS team for 16 years. For 18 years before coming to MPS, Melissa had a successful professional accountant career. She joined the MPS team in 2004 <coughs> as a social studies teacher at Midland High. Melissa moved into her current position, technology and media curriculum specialist in 2017-18. Melissa earned her Bachelor's of Science degree in accounting from Saginaw Valley State University in 1999. Her teaching certification also from SVSU with an emphasis in economics and government in 2004. In 2006, Melissa earned her Master of Arts degree in teaching from Grand Canyon University. This is Melissa's second shining star. Her first was in April of 2018. Ms. Toner was nominated by MPS colleagues. Among their comments were the following. Melissa is a respected and trusted leader and educator is known for a willingness to go above and beyond to support teachers with their instructional technology needs. Melissa has been one of the MVPs stepping up in a big way when we moved to remote learning in March as she has helped our teachers build their skills in virtual learning. Since that time, she has worked relentlessly to move MPS forward with our on or with our new learning management system, Canvas, and to ensure teachers are well supported along the way. Throughout the summer, and fall, she hosted numerous workshops, open help sessions, and many individual support sessions, basically doing whatever it took to be sure that teachers felt confident and ready. I am so grateful for all the training Melissa provided and for her willingness to answer all my questions through email. She has a wonderful way of building people's confidence and giving us hope, which is really needed during this difficult time. Melissa is an excellent presenter. Learning something like Canvas can be a high anxiety situation, but she is so calm and clear in her teaching that it puts everything at ease. Melissa was and continues to be the connecting and driving force for our Canvas implementation. She is the Bridge of Technology Department, the Curriculum Team, Administration, and the teachers in a wonderful way that allowed us all to move forward. Congratulations, Melissa. Congratulations, Melissa. Our second shining star, Deborah Waltz. Deborah joined the MPS team this year as a second grade virtual teacher, with her home school being Woodcrest Elementary. Before coming to MPS, Deborah was an elementary educator at Blessed Sacrament School in Midland for 27 years. Deborah earned her 
both her Bachelor of Applied Arts degree in Child Development with a ZA endorsement and her Bachelor of Science degree in Education from Central Michigan University. Ms. Waltz was nominated for the Shining Star by Woodcrest Parent. Among their comments were the following. Ms. Waltz has more patience than any teacher I've come in contact with during our nine years at NPS. She is learning the role of a virtual teacher just as the kids are and navigating the new Canvas program. The first couple of weeks were very overwhelming for me to figure it out. In my daughter's class, only a few kids have parents nearby to help them. All the others were completely lost. Ms. Waltz, patient like no other, she calmly walked the kids who, who are lost through where they need to be during the NWA testing days. It was a challenge to get 14 kids signed in at one time with only a couple parents there to help their children. Ms. Waltz guided each of them through, the, through where they needed to be in easy to follow steps, even while she couldn't see what their screen looked like. The NWA test stressed adults and kids out. If, the stress, if it stressed her out, she never showed it. Not only is teaching hard, but teaching virtually when you cannot physically help a student is much harder. I can't even imagine. I've worked in a preschool and teach Sunday school and have never seen a teacher quite like Ms. Waltz and how she works well with the virtual children. Truly impressive. Congratulations, Deborah. Congratulations. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, Next up is the request to address the board. Last I knew we did not have anybody in the queue waiting to speak to us. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. We'll move on to item number five. These are the Administrative Services Study Committee. I didn't see any no, any uh, minutes, so we'll move right to 5.1, and that is uh, an action item. Mike. So it's a policy change um, that's out of the sequence that uh, Neola produced in order to come in compliance with the MIOSHA standard of work from home. So it is a temporary policy that would go away during the if once COVID period goes through. Looking okay. for your approval of that. Okay. Uh, take a motion, please. Make a motion to approve item 5.1. Support. Motion by Phil, support by Pam. Any further discussion on item 5.1? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, item 6.1. This is the uh, Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Study Committee minutes, and they're going to be given by Lynn. Yes, be patient with me. I'm trying to read them off my phone. <laughs> um, we met on November 16th, and the first topic we talked about was the major change proposals. The committee reviewed and discussed the major change proposals being presented to the board uh, this month. The proposals to be implemented for the 2021-22 school year are as follows. A name change, change the name of the current courses, web design and advanced web design to digital media, multimedia design and advanced digital multimedia design. There is no cost for this proposal. Number two, the new course, addition of Mandarin Chinese point two and point three courses at both middle schools. Total cost would be $30,000 $30,606. Next, uh, new courses, addition of advanced point three level course option for CTE programs, welding, building trades, and woodworking. Total cost, $1,153. A curriculum revision, improve alignment of grades three to five science curriculum for Project Lead the Way and Serial City against the required science standards and available time. Total cost, $75,157. And lastly, a curriculum revision. Implement new elementary ELA literacy curriculum and related professional learning. The proposal was approved by the board last year, but implementation <coughs> was delayed due to the COVID pandemic. The total cost would be $190,931.
The total cost for these proposals is $297,847. Next, we just had a DEI update. Dr. Amy Beasley shared that action teams aligned to the strategy are in formation with several in the action planning phase. The November staff professional development included a session led by Dr. Nikita Murray on the foundational importance of psychological safety and trauma-informed practice to the achievement of inclusion, equitable, and anti-racist culture. And our next meeting will be in January. All right. Nice job, Lynn. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Next up, item 6.2, uh, Ms. Miller Nelson. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So Lynn just basically read the major change proposals that we have for you, so I'll just offer a bit more detail. Uh, these are the proposals that will be implemented for the 21-22 school year. And I want to point out that at my urging and with Mr. Shero's support, we really work to streamline the number of proposals and minimize um, those that would require a really heavy lift, knowing that we want our teachers and students to continue just working through the ramifications of COVID-19 and those periods of remote learning. So these really do represent our highest priorities. Um, I will share that the committee reviewed these and discussed the proposals. Each include all the anticipated expenses, including curriculum development, staff development, and supplies and materials. And these proposals are available for review in my office for anyone who chooses to uh, request a copy to review. Uh, the name change uh, with web design and advanced web design to the digital multimedia names is really just an attempt to help students better understand the content of that course and revitalize that as one of our career and tech ed offerings. The Mandarin Chinese proposal is the addition of new courses and I'll just bring to your attention that this is the next progression with um, making that language acro available across the district. We have Mandarin at Woodcrest and also through our four cultures and language program at Adams. And now that those students are ready to enter middle school, this is an opportunity for them to continue their learning. Um, we're particularly proud of the point three accelerated options that we're offering now in our CTE, uh, skilled trades programs, welding, building trades, and woodworking. This is, um, I think, a really low cost proposal, but could have a high impact as we believe it will um, really bring the honor that these skilled trades classes deserve and hopefully bring additional students to these courses. The last two are the ones that are a bit heavier lift. The science proposal at 75,000 will require a level of intensity. We'll need teachers to look at that curriculum and make some recommendations about the intersect of Project Lead the Way and Serial City, but we know it will yield uh, more closely aligned curriculum and a better experience for students. And then finally, the ELA, the literacy proposal for elementary. We reviewed that last year and you all approved that last year. It's back on the list because we delayed implementation due to COVID. So again, these proposals are uh, for your information. They'll be brought back to the January meeting for your action. If uh, you do approve them in January, we will immediately uh, include this information in the enrollment period for students as that starts in later January, and it will all be contingent upon final budget approval. Okay. Thank you, Penny. Uh, we have another information only yeah. item, item 6.3, and that one is for you as well. Perfect. Uh, we do have an English textbook that we're presenting to you for information and for the public review and examination period, and this will come back to you at the next board meeting uh, for approval. The title of the text is English Language and Literature for the IB Diploma Program. The publisher is Hodder and it has a copyright of 2019. Uh, this text will be used in our IB Language and Literature 1 and 2 classes, which is both 11th and 12th grade. The text comes to you after being reviewed and supported by teachers of the course as well as the curriculum team. And of particular note, this text was reviewed not only against the criteria that we would typically use, but we also used uh, what's called Teaching Tolerance Appendix D. It's a tool for selecting diverse texts, and that was the additional measure we put in place uh, just to make sure that we are selecting texts that are diverse and represent our vision. 
That book is available in my office for anyone who wishes to review that as well. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, next is an action item. Uh, I, do you want to take that one as well, item 6.4? Yeah. Yep, that's us. Or is it for Mr. Jaster? Uh, it's both of us. So I'll do the first few slides, and then he's got the last one. Sure. Great. Thank you. Okay, here we go again with the monthly reconfirmation of our extended COVID-19 learning plan. And this will look familiar to you, but with uh, some updated information. Hmm. Can you advance that slide for me, please? There we go. So the uh, first requirement is to report out on modifications to our actual plan. And technically, we have not modified our plan. However, we implemented aspects of our plan. Uh, and so I want to draw that distinction. So I did note on this slide, and this will be again posted on our transparency link as of tomorrow, um, I noted our periods of remote learning for uh, DK through 8. And of course, our high schools are still in remote learning. Um, I noted in that last bullet that our preschool and GSRP remained in full face-to-face -face instruction. So again, we did not change our plan. We simply implemented it uh, in alignment with, with the remote learning provisions. Next slide, please. The second requirement is to report out the levels of instruction of our special populations, and this has not changed since the report last month. This is based on current enrollment for those students who are 100% remote and then the percent students who are um, either in hybrid or full face-to-face. -face. We will update this slide uh, at the semester transition as we know that we have students who are moving. Oh, thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, as usual, a summary of public comment. Uh, this is, um, thank you, pretty consistent with what we've seen before. We've had a variety of parents, guardians, and families expressing concern about our transition from re remote learning back to face-to-face -face in December for reasons such as health and safety and lack of consistency in learning. We've also had parents, guardians, and families expressing great appreciation for the transition to remote learning and then back to uh, the face-to-face -face learning in December and again, reasons uh, here included family work schedules and the understanding that in-person learning is the most ideal learning mode. Uh, continue to receive positive feedback that we are offering those variety of options and being flexible, and we continue to get praise for our <coughs> elementary virtual format and that we have outstanding NPS teachers teaching those live sessions. And I'll turn it over to Jeff to talk about attendance. Thanks, Penny. Good evening. I'll just start by reminding everyone that the chart you're going to look at here represents the values of uh, student two-way interactions uh, for each week since our last board meeting as of November 16th. And to be recorded in either of these columns, the student needed to be um, marked present at least two times for the week. So the headings are important, too. So the first column as you can see, all students 100% remote is the middle column. And then those on the right are the blend of hybrid students and in-person students. So uh, just quickly going across, uh, the week of 11-16, it was 92% for all students, 87% and then 95% respectively. The following week was 92%, 79%, and 93%. The week of 11-30, 95 percent, 85 percent, 95. Week of 12, 7, 93 percent, 78 percent, and then 91 percent. And then the most recent week, uh, which I, I will point out too that uh, corrections can happen uh, into the following week. So these numbers may change and they would be reflected if they do change in the next month's uh, board meeting. Currently they're 92 percent. 77% and 92%. And just one other reminder that um, as it relates to pupil accounting, the, the threshold is at least 
of our entire student population. So you can see, if you look at the first column, we're clearly well above that threshold of 75%. Okay, we have one additional slide uh, to share with you tonight. One of the additional requirements of the uh, extended COVID learning plan is that by uh, January 1, we post a list of the training that we've provided to staff, to students, and to parents. So I've taken a, a quick screenshot of that, uh, as you can see, and that will be posted on our website and certainly available if anyone needs that, they can contact me. This uh, multi-page document really reflects uh, an amazing set of workshops and learning experiences that we've provided to staff. Part of the reason Melissa Toner was one of our shining stars today uh, is she really spearheaded this effort. Hundreds of hours of training that have been provided in both synchronous and asynchronous formats. Um, and a shout out to our principals as well who've done uh, their share of training at the school level. And certainly teachers uh, did more than their part in bringing students along and understanding how to use Canvas and many of our digital tools. So we're really proud of this report and uh, it will be available on our website again. That's all we have. All right, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And uh, thank you for all the hard work putting that data together for us. Uh, next up, we have item seven. This is FFO, That's and correct. we're going to hear from Mary. Um, uh, Scott, you do have to take minutes. action on that. You have the reconfirmation we need you to take action on. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That was an action item. I, I apologize. Uh, let's back up then. Uh, I will accept the motion for the acceptance of uh, item 6.4. This is Pam. I move to approve item 6.4, the Midland Public Schools Extended COVID-19 Learning Plan. Support. Motion by Pam, support by Mary. Any further discussion on item 6.4? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, next up, we're at items, under item seven, we're at 7.1. This is our FFO study committee minutes. Mary. Yes. Um, we met on December 7th. Um, we looked at bid package 21-202 and 21-203. Our representative from Barton Mallow presented bids for the AV improvements to both the high schools and the uh, HVAC at Midland High School and district controls. A recommendation to award the bids will be brought to the September Board of Education meeting. Mr. Schauer and Mr. Bruton discussed the following topics with the committee. The October financial, financial statements were discussed. The year-to-year -year revenue variance for October was due to the date of receipt of the summer tax revenue from the city. Purchase orders and purchase card expenses above the bid threshold were reviewed. Um, Item two was dual litigation. The, community, uh, the committee reviewed a proposal retainer agreement to secure representation from the France Law Group through Thurn Law, Thurn Law um, re referral. The agreement will be brought to the full board on the December 21st for consideration. The third item was negotiations. Bargaining with the MCEA will commence in January. The district financial status and future financial proje projections were reviewed. Feedback from the committee was sought to assist in preparations. The fourth item, diversity, equity, and inclusion project um, team structure and status were reviewed with the committee. Um, the FFO will meet again in on Monday, January 4th at 5. Thank you, Mary. We appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Uh, next up, we have an action item. This is item 7.2. This is the Jewel litigation retainer. Uh, Mr. Bruton. Yep. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Uh, per the minutes that Mary just read, uh, Midland Public Schools was approached by Truen Law Firm, letting us know that there was um, action taking out there in the field from France Law Firm to represent school districts on behalf of financial burdens assumed um, by the vaping epidemic, um, specifically 
with the company Jewel. And um, we here in Midland Public, as you know, did invest a significant amount of fiscal resources in trying to combat the vaping problem that emerged, um, not only in Midland Public, but across the state, the region, and the nation as well, too. Um, as a reminder, in total, uh, the board did approve um, over $73,000 in vape detectors and um, also the cabling and installation of all those devices. So we are asking for your blessing this evening to have the France law firm represent Midland Public in trying to seek um, reclamation of some of those lost funds with the approval of this retainer agreement tonight. This is Pam. I move to approve item 7.2, uh, the Jewel litigation retainer. Support. Support. Okay, motion was by Pam. Uh, the support, I believe, was by Phil. Um, yeah. Any further, any discussion by, uh, regarding item 7.2? And I have a question um, for Brian. Brian, is $73,000 our approximate hard costs to date? Correct. Okay, are we anticipating any more, uh, if you know? It's a possibility. Um, okay. At this time, we don't have specific plans in place to expand, um, but it, also we have had lower use in the schools because of our reduced um, capacity in the buildings right now because of COVID. But certainly it's something that is a possibility. Okay. And us joining this litigation, if we decide to do so, it comes at no cost or financial risk to the district. That is confirmed. Is that no out-of-pocket costs, no risk to the district. Great. Thanks for answering those questions. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, item 7.3, this is another action item. This is our bond bid package, 21-202 and 21-203. Uh, Mr. Bruton and Mr. Shero. Yep. Thank you, sir. For your consideration, we seek your approval tonight to award bid package 21202, which is high school classroom technology. This is largely our front of classroom work and also changing of our projection systems in both high schools, largely mirroring what was done in the middle schools as well too. Um, the general trades for 21202 we are recommending gets granted to Sugar Construction of Midland, Michigan for a total of $162,569. For the AV system work for 21202, we are recommending the award goes to Master Electric of Gladwin, Michigan for $404,003 for a total award amount of this bid package, 202, for $566,572. Package 21203 is Midland High HVAC and also other district controls as well too. You'll see listed um, a little bit further down in my talking points that we are gonna be recommending the alternates M1 and M2 also get awarded with this. And for clarification before I read those amounts, alternate M1, M1 excuse me, added all classroom unit ventilators at Midland High for a grand total of 83 and changed um, from trained to automated logic controls, which is the district standard controls pro uh, program. And M2 changed the Dow High train controls over to our standardized program of automated logic as well too for the boilers and chillers over at Dow High, fully completing the controls over at Dow High to that same program, giving us full control of that building now. So with those details, we are recommending for bid package 203 that the selective demolition goes to RW Welding of Midland, Michigan for $54,000. The mechanical we are recommending goes to Ecker out of Burton, Michigan. The base bid award of $1,997,600 plus the alternates that I just discussed, M1 at $493,600 and M2 at $68,600 for a grand total of $2,559,800 for that category. For electrical, we are recommending Ted's Electric Service of Rhodes, Michigan for $68,835 plus alternate M2 for an additional $3,500 for a grand total of $72,335, making the grand total award amount for bid package 21203, $2,686,135. Both of these bid packages 202 and 203 will be out of series two bond funds. 
And I would add this is an example of added scope and dollars at buildings, including middle and high. Okay. Um, Mike, procedurally, do, do I do a single motion yes. under 7.3 or, or because of the amounts of these different bid packages, do we do a, a motion for each one? Single motion, 7.3. A motion for 7.3. Okay. I will uh, accept the motion to adopt item 7.3. So Speaker moved. Mary. Support. Support by Phil. Okay. Motion by uh, Mary. Support by Phil. Any further discussion regarding either of these bid packages? I had a couple questions, Scott. Um, yeah, Brad. We had a bidder uh, under the AV systems that got disqualified. Do we know why? Yes. Yep, it was an incomplete bid package. Um, the forms were not, we did not receive all the forms back that we were looking for, and I also believe that the hardware was not spec'd as we requested. They missed an item. Uh, it definitely, it was the major qualifier. They missed an item. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, in terms of the 21203, there was a, a lower bidder than RW Welding. Was there an issue with that person? Yes, I believe it was out of Ohio, and, and we were ab not able to track any work that they had done in Michigan. I, I okay. Check on that, Mike. I believe that was the one that was from Pontiac um, that we chose to go with our local bidder. There was a $500 difference, Brad, and yep. to go with our bidder from Midland, uh, we the committee felt that $500 experience. was best for local control, for local bid award on that. Okay. Um, Brian, do you have any experience with Ecker Mechanical? I know we got a ton of experience with the other three of yes. William Walter, Johnson Wood, and Reamer, but I don't recognize them. I do. Yeah. So, previous bond project in the previous district. But we do have experience, yeah. performed well enough, and certainly Barton Mellis had vast experience with them yeah. in different areas. Mr. Vanderpool, our consultant, did some fact-finding and background checking and is very confident in their ability to carry out this project. Okay. Well, we haven't had them here in Midland. At, no, this yes. is their first uh, award in this district, yes. Okay. Um, with the HVAC and controls, will there also be um, an a, a asbestos abatement contract of any kind, or don't we know? Uh, all the details of what we're tearing out and what we're putting in if we're going to run into asbestos. Don't believe there is on this project. We will have asbestos coming to you for under the performance contract and under two, 204, which you'll be proven next month. Will that be relative to these, or it's totally different? A different, different award. Predominantly tile, if I remember. Flooring, yes. Okay. We, we expect it, Brad, in bid package 204, which will be coming to you at the January, I'm going to get this wrong, 21st, I believe, board meeting as well, too. Correct. Yep. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have uh, item 7.4, Brian. Thank you, sir. Three gifts for information this evening, totaling $3,100. The first is $1,000 from the Hollenbeck Foundation for the support of DEI initiatives, specifically at Midland High School. A $1,500 anonymous donor for a new IB diploma sign over HH Dow High School. And continued support from SK Communications to help us offset some of our ongoing costs for hotspots for the amount of $600. And if okay with you, I'll move on to 7.5, sir. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. And three gifts requiring your action for accepting this evening. All three of these gifts are related to the H.H. Dow High School Turf Project. The first from the Herbert H. and Grace A. Dow Foundation, a total of $400,000. From the Midland Area Community Foundation, you'll see two different awards. Um, one, the $100,000 comes from the Community Foundation itself and the amount of $129,873.12 comes from private donations that were donated to specifically that fund over at the Midland Area Community Foundation. And because of the size of these awards, we require your action this evening to accept these on behalf of the HH Dow Turf Project in Midland Public Schools. Okay. Thank you, Brian. I will accept a motion. I'll move. Support. 
Motion by John, support by Mary. Any discussion regarding item 7.5? Can we get an update on the project of where we stand? And is it's, it's completed at this point in time. Okay. The turf is. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much to our donors and uh, board for approving that. Uh, next up, we're at Human Resources, item 8. This is item 8.1. We are going to get study committee minutes uh, from John. Thanks, Scott. The uh, HR study committee met on December 10th. We reviewed uh, upcoming MCEA negotiations. The uh, committee was given a summary of the district's current and forecasted financial position in preparation for upcoming collective bargaining agreement negotiations. Uh, we also got an update on recruitment and uh, selection. Uh, Mr. Kowalski shared progress updates on recruitment and selection of Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, School Social Worker, and Speech Language Pathologist. Uh, virtual career fairs for the spring of 2021 were also discussed. Uh, we also got an overview of substitute teacher relief um, efforts. A recently proposed house bill which would change substitute teaching eligibility was discussed. The district is evaluating which staff members would be eligible to serve as substitute teachers during days when several absences are reported. And our next meeting will be February 11th. All right, thank you very much. Next up, item 8.2, Mr. Jaster. Thank you. Sadly, there are five uh, names on your agenda tonight, and I'll go through these quickly. Uh, the MPS board and staff extend their deepest symp sympathy to the families of the following retirees. First, Mr. Donovan Chamberlain passed away December 1st, 2020. Donovan taught mathematics before becoming an assistant principal and principal at Central Intermediate. He retired from MPS in 1978 after 27 years of service. Miss Carolyn Davis Jennings passed away December 5th, 2020. She taught third grade at Seabird Elementary, retired in 1988 with 22 years of service. Miss Doris, Doris Finn passed away December 10th. Doris was an elementary teacher for 21 years at Sugnet and Plymouth. She retired in 1990. Mr. Daniel Shepard passed away November 18th, 2020. He taught drafting, driver's education, also held the position of counselor, assistant principal at Dow High School, and then principal at Midland High School. He retired in 1994 after 33 years of service. And then last on this list, uh, Ms. Patricia Smith passed away December 10th, 2020. She had been an art teacher at several different schools throughout the district and also was um, held the position of coordinator of art education for the last nine years of her career. She retired in 1994 with 29 years of service. And I would just add on a personal note, um, I had the good fortune of having Mr. Shepard as my principal, and I can attest that he had a huge impact on the lives of numerous students, uh, myself included, and he'll be deeply missed. If, All right. you, if you would like, I can jump to 8.3 as well. Yes, please. Thank you. The following staff members have also announced their retirements as of the dates listed in the, in the agenda. First, Kelly Bays, currently a teacher at Jefferson Middle School. Her retirement becomes official January 18th, 2021. And Patricia Walters, she's a professional at Midland High School. She retired December 2nd, 2020. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we are at item nine, and this is going to be um, an action item. It is Mr. Sherrill's evaluation, and the evaluation took place uh, last month. And what I'm going to do uh, is just share some comments um, about Mike and about uh, his evaluation. So uh, just indulge me for a second. Uh, Mike, as you know, the Board of Education formally reviews your performance on an annual basis every November. The evaluation tool used by the Board is a series of metrics developed based on research, practices, and behaviors of superintendents across the country. 
Consistent with your history at MPS, you have again received an overall performance rating of highly effective. And for anyone joining us tonight, this is the highest rating possible for a superintendent. It is based on scoring in five categories, including governance and board relations, community relations, staff relations, business and finance, and student leadership. I'd like to highlight some of the board comments, although I'm not going to cover every category, uh, they're as follows. Under governance and board relations, some of the board members said the following. Thank you for the comprehensive communications. Your, our questions are answered in a timely fashion. The board appreciates the timeliness of the board packets in the informative Friday letters. Under community relations, the board said the following. Mike's strength is in communication and transparency. Mike, the board appreciates all the mediums that you employ to communicate with the community. The board would like to see you expand the use of video, pod, video and podcasts as well as enhance the format of the communique so that it can be more easily viewed on mobile devices. Under business and finance, the board, some of the board members said the following. He, Mike is highly knowledgeable and is always able to answer questions. Mike has a very proactive, short and long-term vision for the district. And finally, the annual audits speak for themselves. Perfect. Mike, we recognize that this has probably been one of the most challenging years of your career, to say the least. It certainly has been a challenge for us as board members. We feel that your experience, professionalism, candor, and willingness to make tough decisions have guided this district in the direction that we would like to see it go. You are a tenacious worker and a fierce advocate for our students. You lead by example, and you never forget to shine the light on your team for making Midland Public Schools a success. In short, Mike, you exemplify the absolute best traits that we expect from our district leader. Keep innovating, keep driving this district, and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, if there are any, well, with that, I will accept a motion uh, to approve Mr. Sherrill's evaluation. This is Pam. I move to approve uh, Mr. Sherrill's evaluation. Support. Motion by Pam, support by Phil. Any further discussion or comments for Mr. Sherrill? Sure, Mike, uh, I, just uh, uh, a message of gratitude. Um, there's no question this has been uh, the most difficult year, and um, I just can't imagine anyone else in your seat right now leading us, and um, the board was right on when they, when whoever made that comment uh, mentioned that um, we need someone who's decisive and thought, you know, thoughtful and, and and not afraid to take make the tough decision, but then communicate it widely to our community as well. So I want to thank you for making those tough decisions, and thank your your support staff as well, and the educators that surround themselves with you, um, because uh, the team that you've created is doing great work, and we're seeing that through student outcomes and. Um, in this most difficult time. So thanks. Thank you, Pam. OK. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, item 10. We have item 10.1. That is the correspondence to and from the Board of Education uh, listed on the agenda um, are letters uh, that will be from the Board of Education. Uh, item 10.2 is a FOIA request from Interboro. Uh, next up on, uh, under item 11.1, .1, we have a list of the remaining, I guess our all of our regularly scheduled meetings and special meetings moving into 2021. Um, next up we have item 12, this is our study discussion session. And as part of this item, uh, we have a resolution for Mary. Um, so I'd like to take a minute to read this, Mary. I'm glad you're, you're here with us tonight. So this is a resolution recognizing the contribution of Miss Mary Friedel. 
to the education of children at Midland Public Schools in Midland, Michigan. Whereas, Ms. Mary Friedell has served on the Midland Public Schools Board of Education from 2017 through, 2000, through 2020. Whereas, during her tenure on the Midland Public Schools Board of Education, Ms. Friedell has served as board trustee and board treasurer. Whereas, Ms. Friedell has served on numerous committees during her term with the Midland Public Schools Board of Education, adding significant thoughts and insights on topics discussed, recommendations formulated, and decisions made. Whereas, Ms. Friedell taught Midland Public School students for 24 years before her retirement in 2016. Throughout her four years on the Board of Education, Ms. Friedell continued her dedication and passion for students and learning by sharing her unique knowledge, perspectives, and viewpoints as a professional educator with her fellow board members as discussion and decisions took place. Whereas, Throughout her years of service, Ms. Friedell has made an invaluable contribution to education in all Midland, Michigan, always focusing on the best interest of all the students. Therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Education formally recognizes and thanks Ms. Mary Friedell for her four years of dedicated Board of Education service to Midland Public Schools students, staff, families, and the community dated this 21st day of December, 2020. Thank Mary, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours if you'd like it. Just, it's, um, it's been a real learning experience. Um, a lot different than teaching, um, but still a way that I could remain involved with the district and um, I appreciate everybody's help um, and uh, willingness to work with me. It was, it's been fun. It's been good. It has been so much fun, and you've been a blessing to our board and, and an absolute pleasure to work with. And I wish you all the best in whatever you're doing from here out. We hope you keep in touch, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments from board members regarding clarification of anything that was discussed tonight before I turn the floor over to Mike. Pam, Scott. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Pam, go ahead. Um, it's not clarification for tonight, but uh, I did want to mention that the Michigan Association of School Boards uh, Governance Committee met uh, a week ago and we talked about 2021 priorities, uh, both current and longer term. And uh, board members across the state of Michigan were asked to participate in priority setting sessions. And all of those who participated then helped create the, the list of priorities. And then the governance committee goes through that list and prioritizes or, or selects, say, the top eight priorities for the school for the following year. So um, we're in that process now. And, um, and I appreciate everybody's uh, input who, who was able to uh, take advantage of uh, being at one of those priority setting committee meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for attending those on our behalf. We appreciate it. Uh, John. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, I've got, I guess, two issues that I'd like, and I, I don't expect answers tonight. I, I, I'm just putting these out uh, to, to Mike and the team for, Things I'd like a little bit more uh, maybe clarification on. And I, one I was going to bring up just because it, it was the subject of an email to the board. And I've gotten a, a couple of questions from community members about it. And there appears to be an expectation among some people in the community that we have an obligation to spend an equal amount of money on the two high schools in our district. That is inconsistent with my understanding of our fiduciary duty as trustees of the Midland Public Schools. My understanding is that we are charged with managing the assets in the best interest of the district as a whole. We've got different buildings with, of different vintages, different mechanical systems, different uh, amenities, some of which are more expensive to maintain, some of which are less expensive to maintain. So. 
you know, and it, as I said, I was going to bring this up because we got an email to this effect over the weekend, and and I had some comments about it in connection with the the uh, the turf field uh, at Dow High, and I just think it's I'm hearing enough about it. I guess I'd like for us to, as a group, get an understanding of whether there is some expectation, because if that's a policy decision that we're making, we should understand that. Again, it's not consistent with my understanding, but I want us to, you know, I think we should all get on the same page about that and be clear because there does seem to be some expectation from members of the public that if we spend, you know, if we build something or add an amenity to one building, then we have to do an equivalent expenditure at the other building. And that just doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. And I'd like to understand better what the expectation is. Well, John, let me briefly answer that. Yeah. So there is no obligation to do to spend equally. In fact, I would say equally it would be not fair. Um, we certainly prioritize our buildings based on enrollment and need. And so um, depending on the size of the buildings, you spend differently. You also spend differently based on grant dollars that come in from the federal government and the state to each building. When it comes to the bond, um, that certainly should not be the case. You certainly should look at what is needed at each building as you go through. Um, Midland High is the older of the two, but actually had the most recent upgrades prior to this bond. So the sinking fund that was passed before I arrived here and was used had, um, had recently been used at, at Midland High because it was the older of the two buildings at that point. Now, Dow High became the building that had more work because it had very little updates until recently. Same with Jefferson. Jefferson is, a, is that 68 vintage. It didn't have much upgrade to it as well. The elementaries were the highest priority in the district because they had seen the least amount of upgrades when we came here. So each one of those are moving depending on the needs. Of course, when we get into projects, each one of them have different costs. I think one of the questions that came up also was on the turf on both sides of town. And the turf we know at Dow High is purely a gift from citizens and their foundations to the district. And we just kind of... Um, if you recall, we want to not be blockers in that movement to provide that turf. Um, the turf, and the question I think, that if I saw the one you're talking about this weekend, we actually may almost think the, the question was that we weren't spending at Midland High, and if you count the community stadium as Midland High property, we've spent a significant amount, and we've doubled or tripled the amount that was originally meant to be spent there. So um, it originally was having just turf replacement instead of traffic track resurface, it's had a parking lot paved, it's had the other parking lot repaved, and now it's getting bleacher replacement, and through the damage of the press box, it's had a new press box, new scoreboard, new sound system. And so that stadium seen significant improvement. Same with tennis courts. We redid tennis courts at Dow High, but we built a whole new tennis courts in Midland High. So each building, depending on its needs, and we passed the bond in 14, a whole lot's happened between 14 and 16 when you go in to do work. Okay. Uh, that, again, I, it, I've just heard enough about it recently that I thought it was a good idea to just kind of put it out there. And if other, and again, we don't have to. Well, the other part, John, is when tonight. you bid. It's, it's a policy decision. There is no, there, there is no policy. Right? And understand. when you bid, we never know what the dollars are going to come in. So those are moving dollars, depending on where the bids come in for each project as well. Which leads me to my second issue which is the the use of of local contractors because that was before my time on the board um i would like to have an understanding again i, I don't expect an answer tonight an email is but fine. i actually think there I should be there I should be one we have to discuss every single thing in a board meeting no but i think it is fine yeah. for board members to ask questions and outside of a, of a meeting, as long as we're not deliberating toward a decision, that's all the Open Meetings Act requires, is any deliberations toward a decision be done in an open meeting. And every, and every contractor and every bid has come to this board for approval. And so, in the definition of local, I mean, um, so this has been going on for a long time. It's given me a lot of gray hair, and I'm getting real tired of the argument. Define local as whatever you'd like to define it, and I'll put it down on a piece of paper for you how it defines it, and hopefully that's satisfied. All we've done is provide every contract in the city so you can determine if you think it's local or not. And there are contractors who come hundreds of miles for work on every job site 
if it's a, if it's a large enough job site. And so is it the Great Lakes Bay region? Is it only Midland County? Is it Midland and Gladwin? Define wherever you want it, we'll put the city on it. I think the bond speaks for itself. Significant amount of dollars spent here. Tonight you saw almost all local bids again on there tonight. So I think there was, there was never a set expectation on how much local. We've always wanted to spend the bond funds where we can locally and we have done so. And we've also kept in mind buying power for the taxpayers. So I think we've done a good job on it. Okay, what I was gonna say was, as far as I'm concerned, our job is to, is to account for the taxpayer's money. If a company from Flint is the low bidder and they're qualified to do the work and they're low by $400,000 and they wanna incur the cost, whether it's paying their employees mileage or wear and tear on their vehicles to drive back and forth to Midland to do the job, I don't care if they come from Timbuktu. I, I, I makes no difference to me. I would like to know because we did have the discussion about the welding, you know, the five hundred dollar difference between the Pontiac well, uh, contractor and the and RW welding. I would like to know: is there, is it one of those where you just know it when you see it, or is there a rule of thumb about we've got a clearly out of area contractor? and a, lo a true local contractor, what is the price point where we say, well, this difference in price is worth it to us to use the, the truly local contractor? So your policy is broader than that. Your policy basically says that you can opt for local contractors um, over bids, but I do think that's where your judgment comes in and how much dollars makes the difference and does that one make sense. So there was two with the Pontiac one, $500, very little difference in the size of that, of that award. Plus it was a contractor that Martin Mallow had very little experience with and had not seen a lot of work performance on. So you get a recommendation from your construction manager who was vetted and hired and is probably the largest school construction manager in the state and they give you a recommendation that goes to your FFO. Each one of those board awards go through there. All the contractors are showed it. The dollars amount show to the board of the FFO. FFO makes the recommendation to the full board here, which again, you're provided all the bid tabs, the dollar amount, and then the motion again tonight. So I think each one's vetted. I don't think there's a straight dollar amount on that, but I do think we need to get um, performance, save, save as much dollars as we can, and keep local as a mind, and I think we have through the bond. Okay, I'm good, thanks, Scott. Thank you, John, great comments, great questions. Um, okay, uh, if there are no further issues, then Mike, the floor is yours. First off, I'd like to thank Mary. I think Mary, I was trying to add it up tonight, I think I've worked about with 65 board members in my career now, and you, you were one of the finest I've worked with, and so it was kind of an unusual relationship where once, you, I guess you could say you once were one of my subordinates and then you became my boss, but it worked very well. So thank you very much. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you may be the first teacher that ex-teacher I've ever had on a board. How's that? Um, real quick, um, we are going to bring you a performance contracting um, award here in January. We'd like it to be the first board meeting in January, but we do have a second one scheduled for a um, regular bond award, trying to get that to the to the market as soon as possible to get our best buying power. And so we scheduled that special board meeting. Um, if the performance contracting language gets done from our attorney and our finance manager will bring that to you. Um, and it could be in, uh, some components in each of the board meetings in January. The reason we're doing that, if you recall, it's predominantly HVAC in this building and you need to catch the spring weather to the fall weather where we can shut everything down over here and have in, um, no HVAC equipment running here. So that is coming forward very quickly. We, we expect two bidders. Brian will be open those later this week. And we expect um, two, two different bidders for you to come in that have been pretty aggressively in here measuring energy and gonna meet that performance going forward. Um, just want to say this is a restart of the K-8 instruction. Um, presently, if you watch our daily postings of our COVID cases, they continue to go down. We've been very blessed on that. Um, we've had no positive cases until this morning. We had our first positive in school, small contact tracing we had to do. Um, so it's gone very, very well since our restart. And hopefully we can see that after the break as well. 
We will be expecting to bring music and PE programs back inside. Um, to do so, we've purchased a, a number of PPE pieces of equipment that are arriving, and we think by second semester we'll have those up and running as well. January, we'll also see our first budget amendment, a budget amendment of the year. It's a month earlier or two than we normally do. We do felt that is needed because with the budget we adopted on June 30 uh, was a shot in the dark, not knowing what COVID was doing to the state. And we were told we were going to get one of the largest cuts we had seen, and they warded that off pretty well for us. So this budget amend amendment will look vastly different than others, where enrollment was a big variable with COVID, and the dollar amount of dollars we received to the positive was, was a big variable as well. And thank you very much, as always, for my evaluation. And it is truly a reflection of the district and the community. So I am blessed to be here. Thank you. OK. All right. Um, that is going to conclude our meeting. Um, before we, I take a motion to adjourn, I just want to tell all of you, I really appreciate each and every one of you. And I am grateful for your hard work. Please have a very, very Merry Christmas with your families and have a safe and happy New Year, everybody. Um, that being said, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. All right. Mary's last motion, supported by Phil. <laughs> Any opposition? All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you Merry very much. Christmas.